You're in a good place now. Relax, breathe, smile. You've entered into your element, the home of origin, the home of intelligence and beauty, where relevant topics are discussed, where what you think counts, and where superior is the norm. You are listening to Perspectives with Ashley Burgess. Welcome back live to Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. Tonight, we're talking about the four biggest marital pitfalls that there are. You know, marriage, some people think it's hard enough. I don't really think it's really that hard. I mean, I think that there are certain pitfalls that we all deal with. There's certain things that we have to overcome. And tonight, we're going to talk about those four biggest marital pitfalls. We're going to talk about exactly what they are, and we're going to later on talk about how to overcome those and how to avoid them altogether. You know, I think one of the biggest... And number one pitfall that we all fall into is my need to change them. Okay, the need to change other people. I think that's interesting because that's really part of marriage, it seems like nowadays, you know, is that you go in on marriage and, and, you know, you like them and all and you love them. But at the same point, there's something that you just want to change about them. You know, there's something that you just, oh, you can't stand. And you figure, you know, if you get married... I think for most women fall into this category, maybe more than men a little bit. If you just get married and everything works out, you'll be able to change them somehow. And it's funny because I think that there's always this like fill in the blank thing. You know, like when you're walking in this relationship, I want to change X, Y, Z about this person. And I think it's interesting because, um, you know, a lot of people go, well, if you didn't like, if you don't like that about them, why are you with them? You know, why do you want to be with somebody that you feel like you want to change? And, and I've been in several relationships in my past where I really liked the person and I got along with them and everything was good and everything was cool, except for like one or two things. And I just couldn't stand those things. Like they just drove me up the wall and I couldn't stand it. But I thought, you know what? I'm going to stick with this relationship because it's only a few things that just really bug me. And maybe... Maybe, just maybe, they'll go away. And, you know, Bill, you know, I think it's funny because I know that you're not married yet. And, and I've been not married. yet. We're not working yet. on it. Not yet. Not yet. But but almost there. Almost there. And I'll definitely be at the wedding. Yes. So, you haven't been married yet. I've been married for almost 12 years now. And I don't know if you've dealt with this in your relationship, but are there things that your girlfriend wants to change about you? Are there things that you would change about your girlfriend? Well, I mean, the, the answer is yes to that, uh, but I think that early on, in fact, we had a specific conversation on this because uh, it was an issue in previous relationships that I had. I told her, that, look, all I'm looking for is someone who will accept me for who I am, warts and all. Uh, I, I don't want you to change who I am, and I will accept it, and I'll reciprocate. I'll accept you for who you are. That's really rare, though. I don't know of a lot of people that go into a relationship talking Well, about like I that. said, I got burned on that. I mean, I had a previous relationship. Uh, this is the one where, you know, she cheated on me. Right. Um, and, uh, and basically, I just kind of rolled over and, and uh, was definitely taken advantage of in that relationship. And she most certainly did try to, you know, I was like her Ken doll or something. So she <laughs> you wanted know? to totally change you. Yeah. And, and that's good that y'all had that conversation in the beginning because most of us don't have that. I mean, most of us, we put the cart, it's like we put the cart in front of the horse. It, it's like the same situation of going to the bathroom and realizing after you've gone to the bathroom, there's no toilet paper. Okay. Most of us go into relationships and we deal with our life with dealing with the things backwards. None of us normally have that conversation that Bill had with his girlfriend about, hey, I don't want to change you. You don't want to change me. There's definitely things that you want to change about me. And there's definitely things I want to change about you, but I'm not going to do that. Most of us fit into the second category, and that is we get into a relationship, we love that person, however, there are a few things that you just can't stand. And I was recently in the car, just the other day, this is last weekend, I was recently in the car driving with uh, with two other friends of mine, they're, they're a couple, and one of my friends it, likes to drink, likes to drink quite a bit. Uh, uh -oh. I, w I wouldn't categorize alcoholic, but I would just categorize the fact that they like to drink. So that, that's kind of a flag to begin with. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so they've been dating for two years now. And in the middle of our conversation, um, you know, his wife was sitting in the back seat, and we were, we were talking, him and I were talking about something. And his wife, you know, kind of came up to the, behind the, uh, the, front, the front seat and was saying, you know, I'm upset with you. And she looked at him and she goes, I'm upset with you. I'm very angry with and you. And you're in the car. I'm in the car. And they go, Ashley, it's therapy time. 
<laughs> and, uh, knowing what you do for a living. Exactly. And I'm like, oh, here we go. And uh, it's funny because my husband was in the car, too. He's in the back seat as well, and he just acted like he wasn't here. So anything. is this a wife swap, you know, swinger type thing? No. Is that what you're talking about? No. <laughs> no. But I have done counseling on this on this uh, couple before, right? Yeah. And it's funny how our relationships, some of my relationships are like friendship, slash cousin, slash therapist, slash life coach, slash buddy. You know what I mean? Slash yeah. drinking friend. Okay. You right. know, all those things. And I said, okay, yeah, bring it on. What's going on? And she goes, well, I'm so mad. I'm so mad. She goes, he shows up home at 3 o'clock in the morning completely trashed. Like, trashed. Like, completely screwed up. And he didn't even know. He he apparently went to go eat, you know, breakfast in parentheses somewhere. And didn't even remember where he went. His phone died. He had taken an Uber to go get breakfast, like, at 3 in the morning. His phone died on, like, after he was done eating. And he decided to walk home. And he remembers taking, like, the side of the highway, not the actual highway, but, you know, the service road, and and actually walked down the service road because it was a lot faster to go that way. It just gets better and better. Totally yeah. inebriated, right? Right. So he shows up, and, you know, and then he's at that point where he wants to, you know, have some loving. Okay, so. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. First off, he, he couldn't find his keys. Um, knocking on the door. Um, so she's got to get out of bed, you know, go to the door, open the door, let him in, close the door behind him, see that he's obviously extremely inebriated even after eating. And, and he looks at his receipt and realizes he'd gone to IHOP. So he'd eaten at IHOP, and so he comes in, and so she goes back to bed. She's angry. She's furious. She's upset. You know, you've woken me up. It's almost 4 in the morning. And as she goes back to bed, he's like, hey, baby. You know, what you doing, you know? And he, she's like, don't even think about getting anything I was going to say, I, I know how that story ends. Yeah. And I'm stone cold sober. Uh, yeah, and he's just like, you know, he's, he's trying to get her, you know, and all this stuff. So she gets really mad. And so, you know, this is the next day that we're all in the car talking. And she's like, I'm tired of it. He drinks too much. He gets out of control. He doesn't remember what he's doing. And I said, y'all been together for like, how long? For like two years, you know, together for a while. How was he when he first met? And she's like, uh, and he, he goes, okay, I'm going to speak up right now. I was worse. When we first met, I drank more and I went out more than I do now. And I said, so she's known since day one, day one. He goes, I met her at a club. I was right. drinking. It was 2 a.m. in the morning. And she knew from the minute we met that I am a partier. I'm a drinker. I like to drink. I like to go out and I like to kind of get out of control. And he goes, so I don't understand. I don't get it. And so she got really angry, and she's like, I'm exhausted with dealing with this behavior. This is out of control. I mean, I want to get married to you. I want to have a marriage. I want to have a relationship, and I want you to stop drinking. And he's like, honey, I don't want to stop drinking. That's the problem. You want me to stop drinking, but I don't want to stop drinking. Right. You enter this relationship knowing that I like to drink. I'm a drinker. We met when we were out drinking. And now you're all high and mighty over there having one drink a night, making a big deal about every time I drink. Well, so, so, and here's the thing, going back to your point uh, earlier, you know, that, that uh, women more than men maybe are more susceptible to uh, this. Uh, there's this nice little fantasy out there, all right? Uh, boy meets girl. And, you know, the the guys in his, you know, sown his wild oats in his wild swing and bachelor days. So bachelor pad and man cave and, you know. I'll take a man cave. Yeah, but so will I. Uh, you know, going out, drinking and having fun and, and, you know, chasing skirts and all this good stuff. And but then once boy meets girl and they get married, then the boy is supposed to, quote unquote, settle down. He's supposed to give all that up. He's supposed to get, now, now, now he's not supposed to go out drinking with, with his buddies. He's supposed to, you know, not go out at all. He's supposed to be knitting and crocheting at well, the house. Well, no, that, that's what the, what the, what the mo woman is supposed to do. <laughs> oh, the, okay. The man is supposed to, you know, mow the lawn and uh, wash the car and, and uh, you know, do stuff in the garage and, you know, uh, So you're saying stuff. that people want, they, they have this idea of marriage and once they get married, they want everybody to settle down and change their ways. Right, and I think your, your female friend uh, falls in that category. You know, she's she just assumed. It's, and this is why I think uh, the guy had a point there. Uh, not not that I defend him drinking and staying out till three a.m. But you know, she's going okay. Now you're married. Now you have responsibility to me. I, I, do they have any children? 
What? Do they have any children? Well, they're not married yet. She's oh, talking married, about yeah. getting married. Oh, oh, they're talking. Okay, all right. Well, she's so- like, when you get married, I want you to quit drinking. And he's yeah. like, I don't want to quit drinking. I mean, why? If you have such a big problem with me drinking, why would you want to marry me? Yeah, I mean, you, you, you know, you know me for two years. That's all I've done. You know? Yeah. But, but again, you know, she's like, <laughs> wait a minute. More than that, but- Boy meets girl, getting married. Now we're supposed to live happily ever after. Yeah, and he's and settle like, down. That's his issue. Is that, and, and that's and I kind of and I agree with him as well. Is that. She's known this from day one. They met out at a, at a bar. They hung out drinking. Her life has changed a little bit. She's chosen to change a little bit of her drinking patterns. He hasn't. He's gotten. A, he's lessened up a little bit, right? So he's lessened up a little bit. He's not as crazy. But now she's wanting to say, hey, you know, she's basically saying she's become exhausted of the drinking. It's such a big deal. She feels upset. She says she feels disrespected by him drinking. He wants him to stop drinking. And if you truly love me, you would stop drinking. And I understand this. There's a little bit of an addiction issue here. And so I get it. So it's a little it's a little less black and white. It's more gray. And addictions can be really rough because the spouse or the girlfriend or the boyfriend can always feel like they are competing against another woman or another man. So if a man likes to go out and drink, the woman feels like she's actually competing against the alcohol. Um, right. The same goes with drugs. Anybody that's out there that, that does drugs, their spouse or their counterpart feels like they're com- constantly competing with that thing. Also, they feel a little bit like they're competing against what happens when they're on said thing when they're not around. And I just thought it was interesting, though, but the, the need for her to want to change him, because I think we've all gotten into those relationships before where... You love them for mostly everything about them except for that one thing that you just can't stand. So when we return, we'll be talking more about the need to change them. And also we're going to move into the second biggest marital pitfall, and that is to marry out of need instead of want. So stay tuned because Perspectives of your host, me, Ashley Burgess, will be back in. We'll be back in two shakes. up and jump in the deep end on Perspectives with Ashley Burgess. The water's warm and there's a swim up bar. Glass of perspective anyone? Now, here's Ashley. Welcome back live to Perspectives and I'm your host Ashley Burgess. We're talking tonight about the four biggest marital pitfalls. You know, the first one is the my need to change them. You know, I've been in relationships before where I wanted to change a lot. Sometimes maybe just a little bit, but there was always some sort of need for change. You know, when I married my husband, when we first when we first met, it was funny because it was the first person that I didn't really think about changing them on really any level. And, and I think it's funny, though, he wanted to change a few things about me, though. I, I know for a fact that um, he finds me disorganized and wants to always try to help me figure out how to organize my life, you know, as far as my closet and my clothes and those types of things. I know the second thing is that when we first met, um, you know, I was just, I had just moved back from Miami Beach. So I lived in Miami and I don't know if anybody's listening tonight lived in Miami before, but, you know, clothes is like a secondary thought in Miami. You know, really honestly. (laughs) You really don't need them in Miami, do you? You really don't. You know I mean? If you have a swimsuit, and some cutoffs and a t-shirt for the most part for the weekends, you're good. I mean, when I moved down there, you know, I, I moved from a more of a, a place that was all about, you know, presentation and, and clothing. And I remember I had like two nice jackets and I think it got down to like 60, like a couple of times a year. And you'd put that jacket on like in January and you'd walk into the restaurant with it. And by the time you got in the restaurant, you're like, I'm dying. You are sweating bullets. Oh, yeah. But you look good walking in, though. <laughs> yeah. Well, you everybody's know. like, that's a nice jacket, Burgess. That, that's probably what mattered most is that you look good. Oh, yeah. I was like, Burgess, man, where'd you get that at? I was <laughs> right. Like, well, you know, but then I was like, I got to take it off. Anybody want to try it on? You know, but a lot of times you get free clothes on the beach. So, like, you be walking walking on the beach and there'd be like some sort of like company like well, I remember when Red Bull was like it started and was a big deal and like Soho drinks and SoCo drinks and Sobe drinks and South Beach it was, you know all these drinks and all these energy company energy drinks would come down to the beach and they would literally give out t-shirts if it was like vote Sobe whatever it was you know, vote South Beach. And so I had all these T-shirts, and I remember I wear those around the house all the time, and Greg absolutely hates them. 
Like, right. These are awful. I mean, they look awful. I mean, you got pit stains in there. I mean, like, like, did you drop some food on that you, one and you, it won't come out? You don't look pretty. No. He's like, come on. So it was funny. The first time I went out of town when we were when we were together, we hadn't gotten married yet. Uh, when I got back, like my whole collection of old school T-shirts was missing. Oh, no. And I didn't know for like a week and a half, you know, but I, I was kind of wondering. I went into the washing machine, couldn't find anything. Went to the dryer, couldn't find anything. Went into the dirty clothes hamper, couldn't find anything. And I finally looked at him. I was like, so what happened with my T-shirts? He's like, what do you mean? I was like, what happened specifically to I'm with Stupid? My I'm with Stupid T-shirt where I have an arrow that points to the left where I would make sure he was always standing <laughs> to the left of me, right? So I'd be like, where's my I'm with Stupid T-shirt? And he'd be like... He was like, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to... He's like, you probably lost it because you're so disorganized. I mean, who knows? It's probably in that closet somewhere, but you're never going to find it. I mean, you could, a dead body could be and, in there. And he, to, in his defense, uh, he had a point. I've seen your closet. <laughs> Oh, God. This is, <laughs> this is rough, man. Please tip your waitresses, even though this might be a rough deal here. Yeah. I know. This is rough, man. I'm getting my butt kicked today. Yeah, no, think about it, though. Yeah, okay, maybe I am a little disorganized. <laughs> I never wrote I never wrote a book. Though. All three of my books, none of them are titled My Organized Closet, so I'm okay. Nobody can sue me yeah, at this you, point. You don't, you don't get therapy on organizing the household no, stuff? No, okay. no, no. I'm, I'm going to let somebody else do that, because gotcha. uh, I'm probably not going to be the number one person on that Yeah, one. You're, you're not competing against Martha Stewart. I'm not Ashley container store Burgess, you know, that's not right. part of my deal. But so there I am. And so I mean, I went through that whole closet and yes, my teachers did not exist. They were not there. And he finally, after months went on and fessed up, they all had pit stains. They all had stains all down them. Half of them were like cut off. Like I would cut them all up. So they would just cover my swimsuit top. And so like you had the whole midriff, you know, and then I was like skinny as a rail back then too. So, I mean, I wore those around on town, but anyway, yeah, he got rid of those. So um, actually you still are. Oh, no, well, thank you. About that raise? Um, yeah, 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 definitely. Always, <laughs> I always know the raise bracket in the background there. So, yeah, so the, so the concept of the need to change people, and I think what I'm trying to say is that if it's something small like pit stain T-shirts, um, I think you can kind of get past that, and, and I think that you can move on, and that to me is a lower grade of change than the concept of going into a relationship – knowing full and well that somebody might have an addiction or might be into something and you know it and you like a lot of everything else about them but you have to remember there's certain things that you may want to change that's never going to change and and you know and the biggest deal is when you know that this is going on in the very beginning I mean, why do you continue to stay in that relationship knowing that you have a problem with that and it's a become a big problem? And when something has become such a big problem that you feel disrespected by it, that you feel angry about it, that you've become so resentful and you're not even married yet, that's a red flag that you really need to sit down and decide – can I get past this or do I need to move on? So let's begin to talk about the second biggest marital pitfall because later on in the hour, I'm going to actually help you figure out how to avoid these altogether. But I want to talk about how these in specifics because I think a lot of people are dealing with them right now. You know, the second one is to marry out of need instead of want. You know, when we marry out of need, we marry for a variety of reasons. You know, it could be money, it could be security or stability or companionship or company or oh, I just don't want to be alone or sex. Yeah, sex is a big deal that some people get married for or to feel needed because you've saved someone. You know, these needs are always changing. Our needs are always changing in life. And it's interesting that once we begin to receive this need from ourself and we don't need our spouse anymore to do it, the marriage becomes a question mark. So I'll give you a good example. I've seen this in my practice a dozen times where a person marries for a particular reason and after several years of the marriage, the need base changes and they begin to wonder why they got married to the person. That becomes the biggest issue. And, and I have an example that just recently happened in my practice. I had a girl, you know, marry a guy because of his stability, because of his financial sense, because of his money, a.k.a. money. And after several years, the wife ends up providing for herself. So she ends up basically surpassing him on the financial marker and then begin to wonder what's wrong with the relationship. Because she feels like she's grown and she feels that he's stayed the same, but that's not really at all what's happened. The problem is, is that it's not that she's grown, it's just that her needs are now being met by herself. 
Right. And so what's the need for him anymore? Well, mm-hmm. she, she's had to adapt. You know, I mean, she still has those needs, but since they're not being met by the spouse, then uh, she has to find uh, some other ways, which, uh, you know, that, that uh, just as a corollary, that's how affairs happen. Uh, which uh, we heard on a previous show, you, you discussing uh, how affairs happen. Shameless plug segment. Uh, if we wanted to listen to previous shows of Perspectives with Ashley Burgess, we go to? You can go to AshleyBurgess.com or Spreaker or iTunes and check them out. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, so, you know, but my biggest deal with her, so th- this client in particular, what had happened is she married this guy because um, she wanted stability. She wanted financial stability. I mean, she liked him. Now, I don't, I would have to sit there and question the honest love portion because I think if you took away the financial stability, I don't think she would have been in the relationship. And, and the biggest deal is that I, I don't think that she had a lot of self belief. And by being in that relationship for several years, she was able to believe more in herself. She went out there, landed a great job that she never expected to be able to get. And what happened is I, over a few years, she started making as much money as he was. Yeah. And so all of a sudden, she looks back and goes, well, I'm making X amount of money, and he's making the same, and I don't really need his butt anymore because I'm already making this money. I have stability. Why am I in this marriage? And I think there's a lot of people out there that are dealing with that man and woman yeah. that deal with that situation. You know, I mean, because we've all seen that happen before. I also think that a lot of times people marry, you know, especially – more more men than women. More men marry women because they see her as the hottie in distress. That they can sweep her off her feet. That they can take care of her. And that she will, in turn, love him forever. You know, I, I think that's an interesting concept, though, because when we spoil somebody and we pick someone up and we, we take care of all their needs and we basically save them, to me, it reminds me of like a spoiled child. There, and when a, when a child is spoiled, the first thought we come to is being rotten. But the second one is that they become resentful. And I know this is an odd concept, but it's odd how in general, when somebody is being given everything, anything and everything that they want, they usually do one of three things. They run away. They cheat because of... They're basically resent, resentment and resentful of that person as well, or they want to have a divorce. And it's interesting because when that same person that's been spoiled rotten the whole time, you know, you see this a lot at the 10-year mark of marriage. When somebody's been spoiled rotten and the man, in this case, sweeps the woman off their feet and takes care of them and gives them everything that they ever dreamed of, that, that woman usually turns around and asks for a divorce and wants way more than half. Wants way more. Right. Wants to leave him with the jacket he walked in on. And even then, she's going to rip off one of the sleeves to prove a point. Okay, and and I've seen it a lot. I've seen it countless examples of the hottie in distress and and saving the hottie in distress go really wrong. And, And it's funny how they either run behind their husband's back with men of lesser quality and lesser values. They either isolate and brood on a daily basis, or they push for the divorce because they want more than their share. And that also applies to men out there, too. There's a lot of women that have actually, you know, you know, whisk a man off his feet and given him everything he wanted and taken care of him. And that happens a lot of times when women are dating men that are younger than them, where they take care of him, and all of a sudden the man starts looking around. And I can think of several cases that this has happened in Hollywood alone, but I've also known that it's happened here in my own practice, where you have a guy that was young, and he was very attractive, and so was the woman but she was 20 years older and eventually as a woman gets older he starts looking he starts looking for women that are young he starts having the vitality and he's got the money now because she has the stability and he starts going out there on the prowl and and a lot of times on the prowl means you know getting with women of lesser quality as far as you know lesser values you know also at the same point in time pushing for a divorce and wanting way more than half and and i think that's an interesting concept and that's all based on the fact of marrying out of need instead of want and instead of desire because if you're actually marrying out of love this wouldn't be an issue yeah, you, you know uh, maybe a good rule of thumb here actually is uh, that you're the spouse or the significant other is not a ken doll or a barber doll as the case may be you yeah know, it's, it's not fair to dress them up and you know then uh, you know put the, put their arms and legs in a certain way and you know make them how you want them to be you, uh, you have to accept them who they are or don't 
You do. I think a lot of times, too, on that, on that same flip coin is the fact that sometimes people allow themselves to be changed like that and then resent the fact later on. And, and I fell into that trap, too. And that can yeah. happen a lot, too, because you're trying to change to make the person happy, but you actually, in turn, lose yourself, and then you resent the fact that you ever had to do that. So stay tuned. When we return, we're we'll talking about the next biggest marital pitfall and eventually how you can overcome these pitfalls and have a happy and healthy marriage. Stay tuned because Perspectives with your host, me, Ashley Burgess, will be back in, we'll be back in two shakes. Jake Busey, and you're listening to Perspectives with Ashley Burgess. Welcome back live to Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. Tonight, we've been talking about the four biggest marital pitfalls, and we just recently were talking about the concept of marrying out of need instead of want. And that's so important because when we marry out of a necessity, we marry because we need something. That ends up changing. The need ends up going away, or the need changes, and eventually we look back at the relationship and we go, what are we doing here? This doesn't make any sense. Why did I get married to this? Where am I? Where did she come from? What am I doing? Where did these kids come from? Oh, my God. I'm losing the best years of my life. He's an alien. I don't speak Klingon. Where did you come from? You know? (laughs) Aliens can make good partners. Uh, Well, you know, as, as, as long as they speak the same language. Sometimes it doesn't matter. It just depends on the need. <laughs> okay. You family know, show, actually. Maybe, the, maybe the sex is good. Family show. Family show. Maybe the sex is good. <laughs> so the, the, the next biggest marital pitfall that a lot of us find ourselves in, the next biggest marital pitfall is comparing the marriage. Comparing the marriage. A lot of us have a tendency of comparing the marriage. Oh, gosh. And I've done this before. When you're married and you compare the marriage, there's no formula, by the way, to this. There's no set year of when you're, you're married, you begin to compare marriages. It always tends to happen to about 99.9% of married couples. And it's funny how some of us compare our marriage to other marriages on a daily basis. And it's funny because we have limited knowledge base on the marriages that we compare ours to. You know, and it's funny how we rarely make a real comparison Instead, we assume others ultimately have a better marriage than we do. And, you know, they must be more in love. They must be having more sex. They must be having sex on a daily basis. Different from me. Maybe that's the difference. I know we're having sex three times a week, and I'm wondering if John and, and Jill over there, they might be having sex seven days a week. I don't know. Is our marriage good? And, and then you wonder, is, is everybody's marriage better than yours? I think it's easy for us to fall into the grass's greener trap because it's absolute human nature. You know, rarely can we go through life without comparing ourselves to everyone and everything. You know, comparisons begin when we feel we are inadequate in a specific area of our relationship or that others probably triumph over us and leave us in the dust. You know, I've done this before. I think almost every married person has compared themselves to another married counterpart at one time or another or is constantly doing it on a daily basis. And I think we have to sit there and think what goes through the mind. Okay, so I've wondered, you know, is is this marriage great? Is this marriage like everyone else's marriage? Is this how they're living their life? Is this what it's all about? The biggest question a lot of us ask is, are we doing it right? Is this what marriage is defined as? And I like that, am I doing it right? You know, better yet, are my kids good kids? Am I spending too much time with my children? Am I not spending enough time with my children? In other words, am I perfect? What do other people do? Yeah. Am I the right person? Am I with the right person? Is this my soulmate? Oh, that's a big deal. People always wonder if they're with their soulmate or do they miss the boat. Maybe my no. soulmate was on that bus over there and I could have taken a right. Instead, I went left and I screwed up my whole life because I have no idea if my marriage is just as good as John's marriage over there. And my marriage could be just awful. And I think that what people need to uh, remember is that you're the other person, that, you know, the other person's marriage that you're comparing to, you're seeing what they want you to see. For the most part, you know, you're not living with the couple 24-7. You, in other words, you don't see behind the curtain. You're seeing what what they're, the facade they're presenting to you. And if you ever peel back that curtain, it could be something just entirely different. Now, how many couples uh, or, or people have you ever 
uh, counseled where you know they showed one face to the public and their uh, you know family and friends, but were was something else completely different was going on behind the scenes. Oh yeah, it happens a lot. I mean, it, you know, I think it's interesting the wondering also if you're in the right place at the right time. You know, I mean, some of us wonder are we are we happy? Is our life just as good as other people's lives? How happy is their life? How happy is their marriage? How happy is their partner? How wonderful do they have conversations? How great is their sex? How often is it? Is mine right? Is this normal? And I think when we begin to compare, though, the marriage, we don't have enough information. I mean, Bill, you know, it's like we can't sit there and go into the house at any given time, open someone else's door and go, okay, let let me just watch you. I'm just going to put some cameras on you. I'm going to see what's going on. Let's see how John holds Stephanie. Do they, I mean, how much time are they having sex? Let's, let's listen to their, you know, communication while they're getting ready for work. Let's find out if they have any fights. Oh, I, I, I thought you were about to say, let's listen to them having sex. I'm like, well, let's okay. watch them having sex and see if it's just <laughs> as good as what we have. I mean, because I want to make sure that, does he do the move or does he not do the move? You know, <laughs> is my husband doing it right? And that's the question. And a, a lot of people sit there and wonder all these questions on a daily basis especially when they go out with their other married friends and they go to dinner i think the funniest conversation is when people say um you know well we are are, sorry we're late we're you know sex was you know just you know having the sex and you're just like dude really and it's funny because i remember the first time now uh, now, did he say that chest puffed out you know i'm sorry i was late i was having sex (laughs) (laughs) it was kind of like yeah by the way you know on the down low you know me and we were getting down you know okay yeah and i was trying to play it cool yeah yeah. and i was just like okay you know and so i started questioning because we were like married for two years at that time and we hadn't had sex on the way to the restaurant we hadn't had sex right before we got to the restaurant i'm thinking what's wrong with us where did the fire go? You know what I mean? They got fire. They were late coming to the restaurant because they were having sex. Well, there's something wrong with my marriage. Well, then later on, they ended up breaking up. And I, I, he actually, I didn't even realize he had BS that whole thing. They were not having sex. They were having a fight. And so you can't sit there and think about what other people are saying, too. And you can't take that as face value because a lot of times that makes you compare your marriage. And the sad thing is that when we compare things, we always have lesser Okay, that's a way of comparison. That's the sad part about it is that when we're comparing in our own mind other people's lives, their life always seems better. I mean, there's a there's an old show you can listen to on Spreaker or on, on, on AshleyBurgess.com or you can buy it on Texas Music um, or Cerebral Studios. And I was talking about the concept of when people are going to their beach house. And now a lot of times when you hear beach house, you go, oh, God. You know, you're over there thinking like Kenny Buckport. You're over there thinking like, you know, President Bush's house. Or Malibu, yeah. You're thinking about some sort of palatial estate when in actuality it might be actually a double-wide trailer. Maybe not even that. And so a lot of times we're over there comparing our marriage and we're falling into this pitfall of comparison, which leaves us feeling lesser. And last but not least, the fourth biggest marital pitfall is marrying for looks only. Sometimes people have a tendency of doing that. And I don't mean just that they're hot, but this is like their look. Like, I know guys that have gone through three marriages already, and they're constantly looking for that particular type of woman. She's got to be about 5'8", got to have long blonde hair, blue eyes. It's got to look this exact way, but nothing else matters. And then later on, they wonder why she's dumb as a stump. I can't even have communication with my wife because she doesn't understand what I'm talking about. Well, you knew this getting into the marriage. But better yet, it's like when we marry out of just specific looks, just the outside. And I'm not just talking about just the outside, just the facade. A lot of times that we miss a boat. And it goes hand in hand with the fact of, you know, marrying out of a, out of a need or necessity for a certain look, a certain type I mean, haven't you met couples where I've, I've met them where you go out to dinner with them and the guy's like 40 years older, 40 years older than than the wife. And they've been married for 40 maybe, years older. Yeah. Good grief. And so, they, so, so this guy's loaded then. Yeah. <laughs> That's the only time that ever happens. Yeah. Like a girl, like a 40 year old, a 35 year old woman marries a 70 year old man. Yeah. He's loaded. Yeah. He, he's yeah. He's got a lot of money. Yeah. Every time. But they always marry these crazy women. Okay, because there's a certain level of a woman, there's a certain mindset of a woman that's going to marry a 70-year-old man. And I'll be honest with you, they're normally not freaking balanced in the mind. 
Okay, because that's hard to overcome. And I'm not being a jerk about it. You know, hey, if you're lucky and you get a 35-year-old woman when you're 70, well, applause for you. I hope she doesn't kill you in your sleep. <laughs> Hopefully she's not an axe murderer. Yeah, I hope she doesn't scratch your eyes out with her nails. I mean, I knew a guy that called me. He was one of my clients one time. Called me up one morning at 6 in the morning and said, uh, my girlfriend I had to call the police on. She tried to scratch my eyes out. Uh, I had to call the police. They had to come get her out of the house. Um, you know, I still think I'm in love with her, though. I mean, she's just got that thing about her. And I'm like, dude, you're crazy. You're, you're going to be proud of me, Ashley. Guess what uh, Jen and I did last week? You, you, she scratched her eyes out? Well, before that. Okay, what? We watched a movie. Oh, my God. And guess what movie it was? It was Gone Girl. Oh, you know, Lord. Affleck? Yeah, yeah. How yeah. was that? Oh, it was actually a great movie. It was a thriller. You know, okay, psych- cool. Psychological thriller type movie. Um, you know, of course, you know, knowing Jen, I thought it was going to be some chick flick, but uh, but no, it's actually a really good movie, and uh, and that's actually the plot line. Uh, he m- married the the girl who turned out to be just nuts, really, and tried to tried to fake her own death and set him up for murder to send him to jail because he didn't turn out to be what she wanted him to be. So she pretended Whoa. to be murdered in the hopes of setting him up, and it almost worked. Oh my God! He probably had to run for his life. He had to like probably get away with all kinds of stuff and try to show, like, prove the fact that he didn't murder her. Yeah, yeah. that's got to be hard, especially when the person's missing. So, so when you're just describing that, that's why. Wow, I just watched a movie like that. I haven't seen that movie yet. Well, you should. Well, I hey, could have written the so movie. So I have seen a movie that you haven't. No. Uh, this this is a, a special day in the history of perspectives with Ashley Burgess. And Burgess could have written that movie. I bet. <laughs> probably. And yeah. I've seen I've seen it a dozen times. But I've seen it every day. Yeah, yeah. It's awesome because yeah, it's the same thing as that you still. I remember guy and we, we still talk uh, here and there and we were very good friends back in the day and I remember being over at his house and hanging out and he used to have a smart home and this was years back in the day when, when having a smart home was like very up and coming very cool like he, like keys you could turn keys off keys could work one day or you could turn it off the next and so me and some buddies were all hanging out at his house one night and we're all talking hanging out he had to go to bed early because he has you know he's a doctor with a couple of private practices so he had to go to bed early and we're all hanging out, just having a great time drinking and everything. And my phone dies, and I didn't have a charger for it. And I said, hey, um, you know, I need, to, I need to borrow your phone real quick. He's like, okay, okay, just don't wake me up. Here's a phone. Be, by the way, don't answer it for anything. And so I'm talking to a buddy on, my, on the phone, and the phone goes dead. And, you know, like it, it clicks out, out of, you know, it, it, I, I lost all the bars, you know. So all of a sudden, about half a minute later, the phone rings again and it says unavailable caller. And I just assumed it was my buddy that I was on the phone with. So I pick up the phone and I hear, hello? I was like, hello? And I hear this, hello? Who is this? That's funny. And I was like, uh, uh, I was like, uh, who's this? And so, like, I got my voice just a little lower, you know what I mean? Just a little, who's this? <laughs> a little huskier, yeah. Yeah, like, like I'm a dude. Okay, so there, whoa, I'm going to, I'm going to, who are you? And and one of my friends was sitting there and he goes, dude, hang up, hang up the phone, hang up the phone. And so he he just grabs the phone out of my hand and turns it off. And I'm like, man, what's up with that? All of a sudden, the phone starts ringing over and over again. And now the number shows up, okay? So they had obviously, like, blacked out their number. 45 minutes later, the phone is rang 25 different times. Good Lord. Okay, our friend's still in bed. Yeah. And all of a sudden, I hear a car pull up, and then I hear banging on the front door. Okay? Banging. So he comes out of bed. He's like, what the heck are y'all doing? I mean, what is going on? And I was like, okay, I got to tell you about something. Okay, this is what I, 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 I uh, Well, um, oh, I, um. Jeez, I answer yeah. the phone, and then he's like, what do you mean? He goes, I turned off my girlfriend's um, key from working for tonight. Because I, I assumed that I was going to get away with hanging out with my friends. It's crazy. So he ends up opening the door. She runs up the staircase, goes into the kitchen, grabs a butcher knife. Oh no! Comes running after him, running after all of us. I'm like, I'm out of here. I jumped back. I, I went down the the staircase, went out the the driveway, got in my car, and took off. Right. Anyway, six months later, he asked her to marry him. <laughs> I mean, she had a scared. No. She was she she literally after racing around all of us, she went down and was on the ground with a butcher knife, like you know, throwing it into the carpet. Mascara running down her Probably face, screaming, uh, screaming bloody you know, murder. Yeah. Ten years later, they were married. Well, I mean, two what? Six months later, they were married. Ten years later, they were in divorce court for three and a half years. 
All I'm saying is that things don't change. If a woman comes running after you with a butcher knife before you're married, don't marry her. It's not a good idea. You might actually get murdered, but you know what? The the least of it will be that you will get a divorce because you're going to realize she's cray cray. Okay, when we return, we'll be talking more about how you can actually begin to avoid these marriage pitfalls and how you can have the marriage that you want and deserve. Stay tuned because Perspectives with your host, me, Ashley Burgess, will be back in. We'll be back in two shakes. I could lift you up I could show you what you want to see And take you where you want to be Get in here and give us your perspective We're listening You're listening to Perspectives with Ashley Burgess Welcome back live to Perspectives, and I'm your host, Ashley Burgess. You've been talking about the four biggest marital pitfalls, and now I want to talk about how you can actually avoid these pitfalls and have the marriage that you really want. And, you know, and I don't know, right before the break, I was telling you about my friend that ended up marrying the woman that had the, uh, the butcher knife. And, again, I stress the fact that things don't get better. In the beginning of any relationship, when you're dating them, they're normally showing you the side that they want you to see, okay? I'm just telling you, it's like the car in the showroom, Okay, it hasn't been breathed on wrong. It hasn't been in the elements. They took the plastic off at the dealership and they rolled it into the. They rolled it right in. It's sparkly. It's clean. It's got the. It's got the MSRP on it. It's got the coffee machine over to the right, so you can sit there and stare at it. Check out the leather. Smell it. That's the best it's ever gonna be. Okay, so if it's not good while you're dating, don't marry it. That sounds like uh, moms with beauty pageant daughters. <laughs> you know, remove all the plastic and, you know, I'm kidding. <laughs> That's hilarious. That's hilarious. I was actually at a convention. I was actually at a, a, a Houston Film Festival recently, and uh, they had one of those going on at the same hotel. And the girls had like the Debbie Top Ball or whatever. I was like yeah. the little five year old girls. Oh, you know, oh, With oh. the hair all curled and the makeup done and the cheeks red and the dark lipstick. And I'm like, not my kid. No. Not my kid. Mine either. So, how do we avoid these marital pitfalls? The first thing is that we don't want to change people. Don't try to change people. Only work on yourself. That's a big deal. Don't try to change people. Only work on yourself. Like cease. Stop. Cease and says stop. Stop getting into relationships where you feel the need to change others. You don't have to. You can find someone that's already the way you want them to be. Okay? Don't try to change them. Go find someone that's already like that because they already exist. That might mean that you're not with your soulmate, possibly. You know, if you're currently married, so everybody that is already married, honestly evaluate, okay? Honestly evaluate what it is that you want to change about your spouse because you probably want to change something about them. If you don't, well, then kudos to you. Kudos to you. But you probably want to change something about your spouse. So you want to begin to evaluate how much that change really matters And maybe, perhaps maybe, if there's something about you that you may need to change or modify. Because sometimes this makes it easier for us to understand. So think about it. Evaluate how much this change needs to be made. How much happier you perceive yourself to be if this person makes this change. But better yet, on the flip side, is there something about you that you may need to change or modify? And if you know that there's something that you could change and you could work together... And maybe both make certain changes. That's one thing. Okay. That works because sometimes if you change, if you give, somebody else will give to you. So it's not about, you know, it's not having the time score and the court and the scorecard there going, well, you got one change. But if there's something there that you want to change about that person, really think about what maybe you could change to better the situation and work together and be honest about it. On the flip side, think about it. When we demand things from others, they will demand things from us. So on the flip side, if you don't want to change, then you need to stop wanting them to change. Okay, because if somebody wants you to change something, you're going to want to demand them to change something too. And if there's no demands and there's no issue of change, then I think the other person is going to drop their issue. For example, I'm not over there pushing my husband to change anything about himself. However, he would like me to be more organized. Even though he would like me to be more organized, he tries to help and he tries to push in that direction, but he doesn't give me an ultimatum. And eventually I'll get to that point where I might be more organized or I might not. However, that's not a make it or break it deal in the marriage. And I think some of us deal with those situations, but it's just how we deal with it. For example, if you have a spouse that you feel needs to lose weight... 
because you feel that that person's overweight and has progressively gotten more and more overweight throughout the marriage. I mean, if you brought it up and you talked to them and you've helped them try to get some some sort of structure and some sort of solution, that's a good way to start. However, if you're pushing somebody and just telling them they're fat and they're overweight, you're going to push that person into eating more because they're going to eat more out of resentment toward you and they're going to eat more because they don't know what to do. Out of spite. Yeah, out of spite. Yeah. Like, if you think I'm fat now, we'll just watch this. Yeah. You know, I'm gonna... or, or just to prove, well, if you can't tell me what to do, I'll do what I want to do. Or if they feel like they don't know how to lose weight or well, they feel yeah. like they can't, you yeah. know, and you're right. And or... Or, yeah, let me prove this. You know, I'll just keep gaining weight. Yeah. And the next thing that you can do to avoid these marriage pitfalls is to marry for love, not need and not for money. If you're not yet married, marry for love, not need. You know, these needs will change. Your needs are going to change. If you're already married and you married out of need, you got to recognize the things you love about your spouse. Even if the need is gone, that's okay, okay? It may help to honestly love them even more because it's not about the stuff. It's about love. So if you can sit there and say, okay, the need has been met. I no longer need them to provide this need. Maybe that can help you actually find true love within them. You know, I think, though, on the flip side, unfortunately, it's not pretty when we marry because we were using someone. And sometimes it comes down to that. I think there's a lot of people out there that marry because they needed something. And, you know, it could be a green card for some. You know, it could be money for others, right? Or the emotional needs. Or you know, I mean, needs. like someone who's, uh, you know, may have emotional issues and they have to have that fulfilled by having a partner. You know, I think my mom fits that category. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah it doesn't want to be alone. Right. And so they they marry or they get together just because they want to be with somebody. It doesn't really matter who. And then they might meet somebody else that seems to fall into that criteria. Or they might just get tired of being around that person because they realize that maybe they don't need that person. And I agree with you. And sometimes, you know, it's not a pretty thing. Sometimes not every marriage, I don't think every marriage might be destined to work. And I think in certain cases, you have to really weigh the pros and cons and realize, you know, if I did marry this person and I was using them for something... Is there something to gain out of this marriage? Is there something that we can actually make work? Can we sit there and come in the middle and figure out what it is that we love about each other? If the other person loves you and you don't love that other person, you've got to do the right thing and step up to the plate because, you know, you might want to say, oh, well, I don't want to get divorced because, you know, they love me so much and this will hurt them. But I'll be honest with you. If you don't really love them, you're already hurting them. That's it. I mean, like, it's hard enough. I mean, you know, you want them to find happiness in life. You know, you hope that you haven't ruined them, you know, for someone else. But at the same time, you've got to step up to the plate and do what's right. And, and I think that sometimes, though, it's looking at your marriage and saying, hey, what do I love about this person? And I think the biggest thing that you can do is just stop comparing your marriage. That's the biggest thing. Stop comparing your marriage to other people. And I think that's where sometimes that we lose the real love is because we're over there thinking about necessity and, and we haven't really thought about real love because we're comparing everybody we know and their marriage. And we're not always comparing just the marriage. We're comparing the outside facade, the house, the cars, the kids, the private schools, or the public schools that the kids go to. You lump all that into marriage instead of really looking at your spouse and saying, if all this was gone, would I still love this person? If all of this material wealth or, 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 not, or, or, or all the bills were gone, on the flip side, would I love this person? And those are the things that you have to look at. Would I love them without the wealth? Would I love them without the, the crisis and the bills and the, and, the, and the collection companies calling me? Do I still love them when I take that away? And I think that's what's really important to look at because a lot of times we lump in money and house and community and all that into marriage. And we also assume that everybody else has got a better, better marriage than we do. And that's just not right because I'll be honest with you, most people don't. And no, most people aren't having more sex than you are. And, and no, most people aren't having this picture-perfect marriage where everything's like one of those postcards where the doggone family's all jumping up in the sand at the same time. Have you seen those pictures, Bill? Yes. Oh, God. I mean, like, you see these pictures and all the kids and, you know, they got the photographer where they all jump up. So it's like, what's uh, uh, Homer Simpson's neighbor? 
Oh, the Flanners. Flanners, yes. It's kind of like that. I mean, it's like, yeah. come on. I mean, y'all went to the, the perfect beach. perfect couple. And you all jumped up. You know you know somebody had to use a mini trampoline. You know the wife probably did. You're like, probably. Ah, she didn't jump that high. I could probably jump higher than her. <laughs> People start comparing yeah. the craziest things, you know? And I think when we stop comparing our marriage, we actually get out of that pitfall and we start realizing what real love is. And last but not least, don't marry just for looks. Okay, if you have married for looks, well, uh, you know, for the most part, those have a tendency of dwindling a little bit. However, maybe you can find a good plastic surgeon to help her get back on her the right well, track. But <laughs> even then, you end up looking like, uh, well, my goodness, Joan Rivers before she passed. God you bless know? Joan Rivers. I mean, God bless her, but uh, did you see her? But I hope that you <laughs> y'all hope that you marry for love, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, and we hope that people actually take marriage and marry for love. And so you can avoid the biggest marital pitfalls. If you do just that, stop comparing yourself, stop trying to change others, and actually marry for love, because that's what all that's the only thing that really lasts. We've got a great show for you next. Stay tuned because Perspectives of your host, me, Ashley Burgess, will be back. We'll be back in three shakes.